Uh, we hear a lot about polls during the election year, especially during uh, this time. But, uh, of course, we don't waste our time with those BS polls that have few black people in them. We actually focus on those that speak to us. The Black Voter Project, they've released their latest survey results in which YouGov uh, interviewed more than 2,004 African-American or black respondents to gain unique insights into black political attitudes. Christopher Toller is the director of the Black Voter Project, co-founder of Black Insights Research. He joins us right now from Sacramento, California. So, uh, Christopher, uh, what are the uh, two or three things that jump out at you in this survey? I think there's, you know, you hit it on the, the nail on the head with just having enough respondents, enough black respondents to actually talk about some of the demographic shifts or demographic findings within the black community. One, um, the number one finding that jumps out is that <clears throat> black support for Trump in our survey is no more than 14 and a half percent. And so all of these other sort of New York Times, Siena polls that are saying black support is gonna be 18, 20, some even 20 plus um, percent support for Trump are misreading and misdiagnosing the black community. And so they're, they're way off in their um, results when looking at how black people are voting for Trump. Secondly, those that are voting for Trump or that say they're going to vote for Trump are really low propensity, unlikely voters. And so a lot of these polls are picking up, even in their likely voter models, a lot of black respondents who are not really going to vote. And so those are a lot of the people that are saying that they are going to vote for Trump and they're going to turn out. Um, we also have relatively high turnout amongst likely voters as well, um, echoing sort of t the 2020 turnout when it comes to black folk. And so Biden is, you know, according to our results, looking relatively good or similar to how he did in 2020 when it comes to actual turnout, especially among likely voters. The poll also did, though, focus on sort of the low propensity voters and, and collected an oversample of black Americans that are not likely to vote. And amongst those black Americans, um, there are some issues, one being um, the, the war in, Palestine, in Gaza and Palestine. There is... Um, Relative support of plurality, almost 46 percent of the respondents support cutting off aid to Israel until a solution is reached um, in the Gaza Strip. And so there, there's a lot of things that Biden can still do and speak to to get those low propensity, unlikely voters out to vote. Um, the voters he's going to need in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. um, and especially Georgia to to keep those states blue in 2024. You say that 14 and a half percent uh, will uh, vote for Trump. You, you say that those are low propensity voters. How does that stack up uh, to 2020? 2020 um, exit polls had black support, support for Trump at around 12 percent. And so it's within our margin of error. Um, we had a large sample, so our margin of error is relatively small, about two and a half percent. And so the, that is within our margin of error compared to 2020. And so we, you know, uh, Black Voter Project doesn't expect major shifts in black support for Trump in 2024. So as I as I go through this here and I look at because you talk about low propensity voters and when I, when I look at um, definitely will vote, probably will vote maybe will vote, definitely will not vote, don't know, prefer not to say. 45 to 64, 65.8% uh, say definitely uh, will vote. 30 to 44, it goes to 51.9%. 18 to 29, it drops to 43.8%. The total is 58.4. Probably will vote. That 45 to 64 is 8% because largely they are going to vote. Then it's 15.1, 22.0, then 13.0. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, that's definitely, probably, and maybe we'll vote. Again, going to the older bracket first, 6.4, 10.2, 13.5, 8.4. And at 65 plus, definitely will vote is 76.7%. Probably will vote. 5.5, maybe we'll vote 1.7. Here's the point that I am constantly making that I don't think these white Democratic strategists uh, or even these white Republican strategists have any idea about. But we also must say this to black people. Folks who are 65 plus and older, they get it. They understand the power of the vote, but those people are likely, uh, they likely self-identify as Democrat. Once you start going lower, and I dare say, really, 
55 and below, folks don't self-identify. So what that means is if you're the Biden-Harris campaign, and this is really important, again, to the white strategists in the campaign, to the Gene O'Malley Dillons, to the Nita Dunns, to those people of the world, they're going to have to actually spend more time, spend more money they normally have to get black folks to turn out because that 18 to 45 group, they make up a majority of the people, the population today, you have to work to get them. And I keep saying the strategy that they have been using for the past 30 years, that strategy is out the window. And even the one that got them elected in 2020 can't be used in 2024. Absolutely. We also asked on the survey sort of how welcoming respondents thought that the parties were. And when asked how welcoming the black or the Republican Party is to black people, only 6% of the, the respondents said extremely welcoming. And so clearly, as mentioned, right, black people are not turning towards Trump and the Republicans. However, when asked how welcoming the Democratic Party is to black people, only 28% said extremely welcoming. And so just as you said, the, the Democrats still have some work to do. They're still going to have to make some arguments. And coming out of 20, um, the 2016 term with Trump into 2020, it was clear that a return to Trump would be detrimental um, and that, that Biden was a clear turn away from Trump. After four years of Biden, people aren't necessarily convinced that Biden can be as clear of a turn as they thought he was in 2020. And so there, there are more arguments, different arguments are going to need to be made because we're not coming out of four years of sort of a historically anti-black president. To your point about uh, welcoming, uh, the extremely welcoming to the somewhat welcoming combined is 69 percent. That leaves you 31 percent. Bottom line is you're going to need that. Uh, and, and, and the thing and the argument that I will continue to make when you talk about black voters, this is not a party conversation. It has to be an issue conversation. And what they have to understand is you have to actually speak to the critical issues, but you also have to know where to go. So let's go to the political info in media. And so where do you get most of your political information? Social media, 20 percent. Television, 43. Newspapers, 3. Online, Internet, 25. Trusted community leader organizations, 1 percent. Email messages, notices, 2 percent. Text messages, 1 percent. So I'll say this here. If you actually combine social media and online Internet, because I really think you're talking about the same thing there, that right there is 45 percent. Those two combined is higher than television. And so, again, if you're Biden Harris or if you're other folks who are, if you're those Democratic senators and you're trying to win in Nevada, trying to hold Sherrod Brown in Ohio, you've got Tester in Montana, you've got Casey in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so, and trying to hold those positions. Obviously, also Brooks uh, is going to be the nominee against Larry Hogan in Maryland. They better have a strong campaign that's digital as opposed to dumping your money on television. Yeah, if you, if you go back to what we were saying about low propensity voters, that's even more so the case where low propensity voters, those younger voters, those voters that are less educated are also more likely to go to the online sources for information. They're more likely to turn to the internet or turn to social media rather than tuning into a two, three hour news program in the evening or go online and read a newspaper article. And so it's, it's absolutely important. And so here's what's interesting. And actually, I would have loved for, for this question to actually go deeper when you talk about black media, because you asked the question, do you rely upon black media outlets or programs that focus on the black experience for political information? Yes, 9%. No, 69%. Don't know, 14%. Prefer not, prefer not to say 9%. The reason I would have wanted to ask an additional two or three questions, because I would have, I would have wanted to know what do they refer to as black media outlets? Because uh, one of the things that we know is that a significant number of black folks get their information from radio and if you're listening to frankly radio shows where they're playing music and it's gossip and other stuff you ain't getting real political information and so i really i really would i really want to unpack that particular question to know what, what they what they are defining as black media are they defining bet as black media they don't have any news shows other than a monthly magazine show so i i, I would have wanted a couple of more questions in that category 
Yeah, we, we wanted to go deeper there. We ran out of space on the survey, unfortunately. But um, I'll just mention this is the first cut at this. We are lucky enough to collect a unique sample here where we're going to have a longitudinal design. And so there's going to be two to three more waves of this survey where we're recontacting the same respondents um, prior to and right after the election. So there's going to be a lot more data to come. We were able to ask those that said they did rely on black media, what black media was to them, what type of black media. And not surprisingly, your show kind of came out on top as one of the highest mentioned forms of black media. But people also did mention BET, as you said. They mentioned the Grio, um, the Root, and some of those other um, sort of questionable or debatable um, sources of media as to whether or not they are black owned and actually speaking to and from the black experience. Well, I, abs- I absolutely would love if you're going to do this again later in the year uh, to, to go a little bit deeper there. Because in, in, in the reason being, that's important. Because when we're making the argument to these campaigns, uh, why, if you're going to be spending money elsewhere, why you should be spending money on black owned media, that stuff is critically important. Let's go to my panel for questions. Representative Jolanda Jones, your question. Yeah, here's what's funny. So I'm I'm an elected official. I've got to determine how I'm going to spend my money to get my vote. I don't put, I don't put anything on TV because I, I DVR everything that I watch and I don't, listen to political campaigns. I mean, you know, political commercials. So I know, for example, here in Houston, we have black newspapers rolling. You know, you're from here. Yep. We have black newspapers that are pretty reliable. So a lot of older black people who we know will be voting and who understand the importance of voting, that's where they get their information from. There are also certain news, uh, certain radio stations that aren't news based, but their music, like for example, Magic 102, Older people listen to 102. Now, uh, you can expect that you have to pay more for that because the voters listen to that and pray. So religious stations, they listen to that. So I think that white people who poll black people are always wrong. At least they're always wrong here in Houston. Uh, They make projections and predictions all the time based on their polls. And most black folks, if you contact them, we ain't feeling out nothing. We're not about to tell you what we're doing in our house. We don't know where you come from or any of those types of things. So I think you hit it right on the nail, Roland, that how are you, like the methodology that you are using, is it really designed to get the true feelings of black people? Something that I would like to see is to talk to the people that are not going to vote and find out from them, why are you not voting? Like, tell me what the impediments are, whether you don't believe in the system, whether you ain't got transportation, whether you ain't got no money, whatever. And I would speak to that. And so I think that there is a huge space for black people. I think the Democratic Party nationally and within the states and within the counties need to get more black people on their campaign teams and let the black people do that. Because the days of white people knowing what we're going to do and the days of us just accepting with whatever white people tell us, that's out the window. It's out the window. It's it's out the window. And so that's what I will say. And I also believe that, no, we're not about to go run and vote for Trump. I don't see that here. But I also know that we don't trust the Democratic Party at the state level or the national level because they consistently go after Hispanics and progressive whites and independents. And they take our vote for granted. And we're sick of it. But but, but, but Christopher, to the point she makes right there that I I, I do want to jump on uh, real quick, and that is this here. When Jolanda makes, makes the point about um, uh, folks not running to Trump. Here's the thing that we have to factor in. Since 2012, with Obama's re-election run against, with, against Romney, 2014 midterms, 2016 presidential election, 2018 midterms, 2020 presidential election, 2022 uh, midterms, you've seen a drop in black voter turnout. So what happens is, if you have a drop in black voter turnout, the reason why that percentage of folks who are voting for Trump or Republican looks larger than it normally is, is because fewer black people are voting. So Christopher, the, so what Jelana also said, which I, do, which I do think could be very interesting, solely locking in on the people who are in the maybe, definitely, will not vote, don't know, because that's 
21, that's, 20, that's 27 percent. The reason that is interesting to me is because that's a big piece that I keep talking about on this show. We have to be maximizing our vote. If black people vote at 60, I don't, 60 is the low, right. but I really want 70. If we look at the raw numbers, we can sweep elections. We yep. can flat out sweep elections. And so that's part of the thing for me, trying to explain to our people, yo, when we talk about we want stuff, we could sweep elections if we're at that number. But if we're at 26, 28, 32, 35, 40, the power is being left on the couch. And then people are like, well, nothing has happened. Because the power, it's like having a, it's like having a, it's like having an iPad that's dead because you ain't plugged it up. You need power to charge it. No, I think two, two things here. One, the, the Obama years, you see a dramatic increase, historical turnout for black folk and support for Obama for right one. You have people getting off their couch who normally wouldn't vote that wanted to vote for the first black president. And two, you have independents, um, independent conservatives or conservative black people that said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to vote for Obama and go against my party. And so you see the support for Obama skyrocket and support for Republicans during the Obama years dramatically decline. Following that, you see those people go back to their couch and you see those pe- the, the other black conservatives return to the Republican Party in what seems like an increase in support, but it's really just returning to a historical mean. And so that's absolutely the case with what we've seen going on. It's not a, a resurgence of the Republicans among black folks whatsoever. It's just a return to politics as usual after the Obama years. As far as what black folks, especially the low propensity black folks, are talking about, over the last um, two years, we have conducted um, over 10 focus groups with about 50 black individuals, um, both high propensity and low propensity voters. And when we talk to the low propensity voters, the reason they're not enthusiastic about the Democrats, the reason they're not voting is because one, they don't find any connection with the party. They don't feel like the party's speaking to them. And two, they don't really feel any, um, they're being heard. They don't feel like they have any power that, that they can't do anything. And when we say what would motivate you, one of the main things that turns them out is, especially at the, the local and statewide level, black representation, having people that look like them running for office, heading campaigns, and then two, the threat of a possible another Trump presidency or a return of MAGA to, to the White House, to, to state politics. And so those are really the two areas in which we see low propensity voters actually start to talk about and get engaged with politics. But yep. it's a really conversation to have. Uh, and in fact, uh, Terrence Woodbury, that shows a bit of his research as well, that he, his research shows that when you tell black people that your vote could make the difference between winning and losing, that changes their perspective on whether they're actually going to vote. Uh, Rebecca. Hey, Christopher. Good to see you tonight. Um, so I see this is a national survey that you did. Um, can you tell us if you have any insights with like state by state breakdowns, especially in the battleground states among black voters? Yeah, unfortunately, the the samples uh, we just talked about small sample size, our samples state by state are, are still too small. I think the most we have is like 300 in places like New York. And um, I think we, we tried to collect as many as we could in Georgia, but that's still not enough for us to, to say anything confidently about these battleground states. We are working on putting together an analysis of just the battleground states. So grouping all of the sort of battleground states with significant black populations together to try and see if there's something that can come out of that. But Really, I would just echo what we've been saying so far, which is in the battleground states, it's going to be really important for um, Democrats at the national and statewide level to speak to these low propensity voters and to make sure that these people aren't staying on their couch and and to not worry about convincing them to vote for Biden, but to to find reasons to get them out to vote and to get them to the polls more than anything else. Robert. Robert. Uh, you know, I literally just came in from putting out yard signs and uh, going to barber shops around Atlanta. Uh, shout out my barber rock on uh, the last bit of haircut. Those, uh, but I, I think it's important when we have these conversations about low propensity voters. Uh, it, we make it seem as if they just simply don't want to vote. They feel as if people are not talking uh, talking to them. Um, you know, we we all know the old saying: yard signs don't vote. Uh, we uh, know that there's a uh, conflicting evidence on the effectiveness uh, with the effectiveness 
years of radio advertising and uh, print advertising. In your research, what have you found to be the most effective way of communicating to these voters about policies that are actually uh, affecting them and, the, and how that translates to getting them to turn out to the polls? Yeah, so unfortunately, in, in our research over the last couple of years, and especially in this poll, we haven't found any real policy that sticks. And so mm-hmm. trying to trying to talk to low propensity voters about policy gains is, is a really difficult way to, to engage them and get them inspired and, and out to vote, simply because there's there's such a lag in policy passage and policy action and effect to individuals' lives. And so the, the policy conversation is, a, is really hard to have, um, even when you're talking about sort of highlighting the policies that Biden has passed or has <laughs> under Biden that benefit black folk. Even those are, are a tough sell. And so for us in our research, we've really shown, um, one, highlighting um, the historical significance of voting and the reason that black folks should vote um, as related to the struggle for voting that the black community has had over the last couple centuries and really put it in historical perspective. And two, highlighting the threat that's posed if they don't vote and the, the gains that could be lost very, very quickly if they stay at home and the wrong people get into office. Those um, in our research have been the most effective way get these low propensity people out to vote, because as you said, they are extremely disillusioned. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they don't think about these things. It's that they feel like their their voice doesn't have a place in politics and their vote doesn't matter anymore. Now, just quick follow up. We've also seen uh, the Trump campaign investing heavily uh, in the kind of social media influencers and entertainers to appeal to those low propensity voters. You know, your Sexy Red, Lil Pump, Whoa Vicky, uh, Waka Flocka Flame, uh, others. Has there been any anything to suggest that these uh, entertainers being brought into the political apparatus has had an impact on motivating more people to vote? No, there's there's no evidence of that being successful whatsoever. Um, Again, even though we're talking about low and high propensity black voters in in the black community, the black community is still very sophisticated when it comes to politics. And they they see right through these scams. We see through these people. We understand that throwing these celebrities out there, um, Lawrence Taylor most recently, as as sort of black tokens to support the black community is is not going to work. And I've I've actually done a number of research projects looking at black celebrities and their influence in politics. Another question if you guys have time for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and really, the one thing that attaches the black community to celebrities when it comes to politics is that black celebrities potentially face the same struggles that the black community does. And so when black celebrities are speaking their mind and they're getting pushback from the forces that be, that's what sort of drives support amongst them or for them amongst pe- the people. And you don't see that with these these black celebrities supporting Trump because they're aligned with the system rather than actually trying to fight for progress. Jelana, real quick. Yeah, here's the thing. What the Republicans do masterfully is they scare the they stare the crap out of their voters and they go vote. I want to know, have we ever asked about what we're afraid of, right? What we fear, as opposed to we're just disillusioned because we are motivated by fear or anger, not, oh, we can make a difference. That's my opinion based on my over decades of being elected. Yeah, absolutely. The, the main thrust of my research the last few years has been trying to understand how to move disillusioned voters, not necessarily to a place of fear, but to a place of anger. Social, social psychological research shows that if you can motivate people by anger, it's one of the most, most powerful ways to get people into positions of action and to take action. And so when we look at um, these polls and, and our survey results and we do public opinion data and we ask people, how much of a threat do you think Trump is? Um, do you have confidence? Are our institutions threatening things such as the Supreme Court most recently? The people that find these things, Trump, MAGA, um, these institutions, the police, the most threatening are the most politically active, even amongst low propensity voters. And so if we can get these disillusioned people from a, to move from a place of apathy to a place of anger, we will be able to get them to the polls and use that energy um, towards political action. Look, people got to act. People got to stop acting like black folks different from everybody else. The numbers don't lie. When you have a Democrat who's in the White House, Republican giving explodes. 
When you have a Republican in the White House, Democrat giving explodes. When the Democrat wins, you know what those Democrats do? Okay, we're good. We can go back, which is the dumbest shit in the world. And I keep trying to explain to people the elections, the election is the end of one process and the beginning of another. What you cannot do is when the election is over, go, okay, I voted. Again, I go back to 2008. I did Wanda Sykes' show. I did Monique's show. It was on BET. And they were like, well, I did my part. I'm like, no, you did your part for the election. Now that the election is over, now we've got to push and prod and demand action on our agenda. And, and that's where I want black folks to also be. <clears throat> I hear all kind of black folk. Man, all Obama did was uh, uh, do stuff for the LGBT community. Guess what? Within the first 90 days of his administration, they gave him a 52-page agenda. Do you know when black groups submitted a black agenda to Obama? In year five. I was there. I covered the event. And so that, to me, Christopher, is a, a part of this. We also have to make folk understand that we can't just show up when we're pissed off. We have to t take that anger and it, fuel it to drive us to the ballot box. But then once they win, say, hey, hey, we ain't left. We watching your ass. You got to be doing what we want y'all to do. That's the piece that I think is often missing. Yeah, I think so. And, and right. we asked that relates right. to this, whether or not there should be a, um, a third party when it comes to politics to challenge the, the first two. And, you know, almost half of the respondents said absolutely so. And so there's there's this need or this want to have consistent competition for black needs, for black wants amongst the two parties. That just isn't there right now. All right. Where can people go to get uh, to see the, the full uh, results of the Black Voter Project uh, survey? Two places. It's, it's on both of uh, the websites I run. One, the blackvoterproject.com, and then also my um, consulting website, blackinsightsresearch.com. Both of those have the full, pro the full results. Um, and my partner at Black Insights Research, um, Archon, Chris Parker, wanted to make sure he sends his hello as well. All right. Tell him I said what's up. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and y'all don't be shocked with mainstream media. Don't call Christopher because you know that's what they do. They show the white polls all day. But when you actually have black polls that survey actual black people, it's amazing how they never end up on MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS and NBC. But they love quoting the white polls that only talk to probably six to eight, ten black people. That's how it goes. All right. I wanted the people of Baltimore to hear it from me. I have done nothing wrong. But I see that what you are trying to do is destroy this black woman for doing her job. I have heard your calls for no justice, no peace. However, your peace is sincerely needed as I work to deliver justice on behalf of Freddie Gray. Marilyn was a force to be reckoned with. I was assuming this is all because of Freddie Gray, but it actually is much deeper than that. Baltimore's top prosecutor, a woman named Marilyn Mosby, was indicted yesterday in the Eastern District of Maryland for perjury. Couldn't help but think about Donald Trump. This is what you gotta deal with when you are a black woman fighting for just causes in America. Yeah, it's but just taking, just taking on the police, period. She's stepping on their toes. They wanna cross her out of the system so she can't stand up for the preacher. Reach the pool and grab me and pull me out. Imagine if this were you. You would want people to stand in your corner. I lost my car. I lost my job. I lost my marriage. And I almost lost my mind for a little while. It is so much right now, Lord, and I'm just here. Why are you putting all of this on me? I'm about to break.